Let's get into the scripture. We're going to jump into the Bible uh, today. I want to invite you to go to uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 5. If you have your New Testament there, Galatians 5. We're in this series called Holy Spirit, and I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, go online, go on our website, or you'll see a QR code that will jump up in just a moment uh, about how to download an ebook that we've created. Our, our creative arts team has put together um, some um, poetry, some art, there's theology, there's practical stories about the infilling and the baptism and the outworking of the life of the Holy Spirit. We encourage you to grab that book. It's pretty, pretty great. I want to continue today right where Jonathan left off last week, and and I was so pumped because what he delivered for us uh, out of Ephesians um, about being continually filled with the Holy Spirit last week was really powerful for me as I watched it uh, online. And, and, and where he took us uh, at the conclusion of his message is exactly where I sensed the Lord just tell me to pick it right up and carry it forward from there. Again, we're in this time now where we're sort of just listening to the voice of the Lord asking us to, to move in directions that uh, we necessarily didn't plan out months and months and months ago. And today is evidence of that. I want to continue off of the question that Jonathan asked last week. The question was, does the fruit of our life reflect the root of our heart? Does the fruit of our life reflect the root of our heart? In other words, is Jesus truly Lord? And if he's truly Lord, then we're going to live out of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We're going to live out of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I think it was Paul, well, I know it was Paul, Paul who said in Galatians chapter 5, it's verse 16, he says, live, or another word would be walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, so walk or live by the Holy Spirit, and you won't gratify the sins and the desires of the flesh. Now, just to make sure um, I'm talking to the right group, this, this could be the 1115, I don't know, it might, I don't think it's necessarily going to be you, but it's probably them. How many of you have desires of the flesh? I mean, you know, sin nature. Who has a sin nature here? Anyone? Oh, okay, it probably is for the other group, so um, all right. <laughs> Walk by the Spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. You go to two verses later in verse 18 of chapter 5. It says, but if you are led by the Spirit, then you are not under the law. Okay, and these two verses are really important to kind of look at in conjunction. They parallel one another. The idea of, of, of a living and, and, and functioning according to the desires of the flesh and being pressed under the law. In, in one regard, you, you know, the flesh, the desires of the flesh are, are the things that we want to do, the things that our heart just wants. I mean, we, we crave after that. It's what we want In the other regard, the living under the law is when we willfully reject this free gift of the salvation found in Jesus and Jesus alone. When you reject that, you're you're saying no to something that's been provided to us by the cross, and then we're turning and finding our desires being met in our sinful flesh, the sinful desires of, of, of our nature, really since birth, and And what we're encouraged, according to Scripture now, is to live and to be led by the Spirit. It's way different than living under the law. It's way different than living according to your desires, okay? Your desires are going to be contrary to that of the Spirit. Now we're being invited to be led and to live according to the the Spirit of God rather than our flesh. And and as you're looking at the text here today, if you've got your Bible in front of you, in verse 19, Paul reminds us, he says, the acts of the flesh, they're, they're obvious, right? And how many know that? You, we don't need to like enumerate them. We don't need to talk about them a whole lot. The acts of the flesh, when you think about sin, it's as obvious as the nose on our face. It's just, it's there. It's always in front of us. It's like we're constantly driving down a freeway with, just lined with billboards of all of the things that we do that are sin. It's plentiful, it's, it's broad, it's, it's, it just yells out to us. The acts of the flesh are obvious, and it doesn't take a rocket surgeon, friends, to know what the sin nature looks like, okay? I mean, sin nature, it's right there, we get it. And when you look at sin, I'm, as if I'm holding it out in front of you right now, okay? When you look at sin, regardless of how we 
reclassify this, regardless of how we reinterpret it, reimagine it, it's still sin. It's still sin. And, and, and here in our American modern church, we feel this propensity to keep trying to relabel it because we're uncomfortable with it because we don't want someone to refer, we don't want to be called a sinner. Who likes, I mean, no one likes that. We want to be affirmed. We want to be pat on the back. We want to be told we're awesome. We want to be told that we can do all things. We want to be told that we're important. We get a star. We get a prize. Everybody wants a prize. But here you're looking at sin right in front of us, and it's obvious, and it can't be reclassified, reinterpreted, reimagined. It's still sin. When it comes to sin in modern America, I find that what we do is we end up playing the role of the serpent in the garden. When the serpent in the garden said to Adam and Eve, did God really say? Did God really say? And Adam and Eve were like, oh, I don't know. Maybe he didn't. Maybe I heard him wrong. No, we didn't hear him wrong. They didn't hear him wrong then. We still don't hear him wrong now. It's still sin. It's always been sin. We, don't, we can't just slap something new, put a veneer over it, and call it something different. Because when you peel the veneer off, you go, it's still sin. Okay, did God really say? Yes, he really did say it. And what we're being invited to, friends, according to scripture here, is we're being invited to, to be crucified with Christ. Okay, it's an invitation to a crucifixion. Who wants to go, right? <laughs> Who? An invitation to a crucifixion. Galatians 2.20 says that I have been crucified with Christ, therefore it is not I that lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. I've been crucified. When we come to Jesus Christ through salvation and through submission and the lordship of, him, of, of who he is, he is in our life. He lives in me. Christ lives in me. That's a profound thought. He lives in you. And then coupled with the infilling and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, man, that work just keeps going on and on and on. And that work, my friends, is not about kind of setting ourselves against sin on a behavioral level. We don't just kind of look at the behaviors of our lives and go, well, I'm not going to do that behavior again. I'm not going to do that behavior again. And, and we approach the navigating through sin on a behavioral level. That's called sin management, and it never works. Sin management never works. Adam and Eve prove that to us. Friends, there are not fig leaves big enough to cover the kind of sin and shame we find ourselves in. Okay? They're in the garden. They are naked and ashamed, the Bible says, and immediately start reaching for fig leaves. Ah, cover up. No, the emperor is naked, right? Okay? He has no clothes. And once you realize that we are standing before the Lord in our sin and shame, we stand before the Lord naked, it's like, no, we can't cover this up. That's sin management and never works. It's like, it's like whack-a-mole. You know what I'm talking about? Just going, Kruh, Kruh. You're just trying to keep the sin at bay and you can't do it. There's got to be another way. Then the way for us is to be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and then to live in the Spirit and be led by the Spirit. Now, this is where Paul switches a little bit of gears. Again, I'm in Galatians 5. He switches gears a little bit. He at first was dealing with the acts of the sinful nature, okay? And then he switches over to something much more organic, okay? You look at kind of the rigidity of the acts of the sinful nature. Now he's switching over, and he's beginning to address the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. And that's where I want to go to today. So Galatians 5, 22 and 23. I want to read it to you, but I want to read it to you out of a different version of the Bible because, here's why. Because so often we read the fruit of the Spirit and we know them. You learn the song in Sunday school. You've got the list of nine characteristics memorized. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. You just got it, you got it down. Even the way I could just rattle it off like that. So I want to read it to you out of a different version to kind of arrest us a little bit. 
So we hear it in a different way. And so I've chosen to take it from what's called the message. Eugene Peterson translated it years ago. And this is just a point of honor uh, as he just recently went home to be with Jesus, like a couple weeks ago. And so he says it this way. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. I don't know if you caught it, but embedded there, you have what? You have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Quick little note. I really wasn't planning and had no idea uh, or desire, really, to talk about the fruit of the Spirit this morning. No real desire. And here's why. I don't like to be redundant. I don't like redundancy. And I knew that I just had finished a pretty extensive series on the nine fruits of the Spirit recently. And that launched into a whole nother series in the book of Galatians that we spent an extended amount of time in. And I was like, ah, I really don't want to go back there. But the Spirit of the Lord really, really gripped my heart just a couple weeks ago. He spoke through an unlikely individual. Now, put a pause there, and let me tell you another story. I was on a flight with my best friend, and we were going to celebrate his 50th birthday coming up next month, and we've been planning this for a long time. We've been saving money, building up frequent flyer points, and just, I mean, just kind of rat-holing money away to try to do a trip to see our childhood favorite band that's been together forever now, going on 40 years they've been together, this little band from the north side of Dublin called The U2. A couple weeks ago, we went. And on the way over, just before getting on the flight, I downloaded my email and I read it on the plane. One particular email came from a mentor of mine, someone who has spoken here at this church, who's had an impact upon many of us in this church. His name is Garris Alkins. He says, I've been praying for you, and I have a word from the Lord for you. He says, I see that you're traveling uh, over to see your favorite band called U2, and I just wanted to let you know, as I've been praying, I had a sense that while you're there, you're gonna receive something unexpected from the Lord. Now, as I was reading that, I was thinking, I'm not expecting anything from the Lord. I just wanna go to Dublin and rock. You know, <laughs> I just wanna have fun. But something in my heart, again, arrested and thought, Lord, if that's true, then I'm open. And I told it to my friend, and we both committed ourselves to be paying attention to what God may want to give us unexpectedly. It was Tuesday, November 6th. We're standing in an auditorium with 14,000 other people. Back home are what we call the midterm elections. The lead singer of the band, his name is Bono, has never been shy of delving into political issues, never been shy about calling people out on things, addressing social issues and politics and addressing kind of the worldwide climate that he feels and senses. I really see him as a modern day prophet. He's been speaking to these things for years and on that evening, on the midterm election night in America, he from the platform began to call out the climate that he's perceiving, a climate that we've been steeped in for some time now, a climate of negativity, a climate of anger and animosity towards people, even people we don't know just because they're not in our camp. This overall disdain for folks, be it online or in person, and he was just calling it out. And then he dropped it. He dropped the line that both me and my friend looked at each other and we declared in the midst of this large, loud venue, we declared that was the unexpected word of the Lord to us. He dropped this line. Joy is an act of defiance. 
Joy is an act of defiance. He went on to say some more things, and I quickly grabbed my phone and just began to dictate as many of the things he was saying because I knew God was speaking to me through an individual. He said these things. There are things to rail against, and there are things that deserve your rage, but the most wily and fearsome of your enemies is going to turn out to be yourself. He says, I may not be able to change the world, but I can change the world in me. And then he said the line again, the line that just gripped me. He said, friends, joy is an act of defiance. You know, joy is one of the fruit of the spirit, right? Joy is one of the fruits of the spirit. And on the flight home, I was looking at my notes and my journal thoughts and things that I had heard from the Lord through my own devotional time, and I thought of something radical, something that wouldn't let go of me, something that gripped my heart and gripped my mind, and that was this, and I wrote it in my journal. I wrote, the fruit of the Spirit are all acts of defiance. They're punk rock. The fruit of the Spirit are all acts of defiance. You live by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the sins of the flesh. You live by the Spirit, and you're not under the law anymore. You live by the Spirit, and you are living contrary to the principalities and powers that rule this planet right now. You live by the Spirit, and you're going to look different in this culture. You live by the Spirit, and it is an act of defiance to everything that stands in contrast and in, uh, in opposition to the things of God and the heart of Father God. Let me, let me just kind of uh, roll these out for you. Think about love. Think about love for a second, friends. Think about love in the culture of self-promotion, in the culture of self-protection, fear, and abuse that we're living in. How different is that? Think about joy. Joy in a time of hopelessness and despair and suicide and loss and neglect. Think about peace in the place of anxiety and worry. Think about patience rather than resentment, rather than cynicism, rather than stress, this overwhelming, this rat race we're in. Think about patience and peace. What about kindness? Kindness instead of envy, manipulation, or anger. Goodness. Goodness at at a time when everything seems to be eye for an eye, and you hurt me, and I'll hurt you back worse. Count on it. I'll get you. Oh, it may not happen to your face, but I'll take it online. I'll say things I'll never say to your face, and I'll say them in a chat box on Facebook. Faithfulness. Rather than being transient and fair-weathered and unreliable, we're being faithful. What about gentleness? Think about that uh, replacing being self-absorbed and and mean-spirited. Self-controlled. Put that in the place of, of being impulsive, greedy, and lustful. Do you see how punk rock this is? Do you see how, uh, how it is? These are all acts of defiance to the world and the world's system all around us. Loved ones, I want you to do something. Having just thought through that list with me, examine yourself for a, a bit here. Just sit, sit quietly for a bit. This will be awkward for some, but let's just sit quietly and just examine yourself. Ask yourself this question. How do you, how do you personally see the fruit of the Spirit growing up in your life right now? Like right now, how do you see the fruit of the Spirit growing and developing in your life? Think about it.
this may be helpful for you. What may be helpful for you is to understand some definitions, some characteristics, some criteria that surround uh, the fruit of the Spirit. If I were to describe to you how the fruit of the life of the Spirit grows from us, I would describe it with these three words. First, it's gradual. It's gradual. It's not quick. It's not instantaneous. It's not just add water. It's not microwave for 30 seconds. Once you start to realize that the fruit of the Spirit grows gradually in you, you start to identify then times when you've responded to something. Maybe it was a challenge. Maybe it was a real significant moment of, 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 of opposition. And you found yourself, I don't know if you've ever caught yourself in this, where you have faced something and you've thought, you know, a couple of years ago, I would have approached that way worse. A couple of years ago, oh, I would have never had that level of patience I would have never exhibited the kind of self-control that I am bringing to bear right now. You see, friends, it's a gradual bearing of fruit. It doesn't come quick. It's also internal. It's hard to recognize. It's hard to see sometimes because it's so internal. When you think of the fruit of the Spirit, I'm mindful of what Jonathan said again last week. Does the fruit of your life reflect the root, again, the root of your heart? The spirit lives in us and the life and the fruit is something that's deep and it's internal, it's a change within us. We, friends, I look at it this way. We can't just take and, and, and tie or tape apples onto a dead tree and say that now the tree's alive, okay? That, that doesn't work. The apples don't give life. The apples are just evidence of life. So friends, when you look at your life and you say, well, how is it that I'm growing? Well, how, how, well, look internally. Look internally. Do you see evidence of the life of the fruit coming from you? And the last scripture I would give you is that fruit is inevitable. It's inevitable. It will happen. It will happen. It'll be gradual. It's gonna be internal, but it'll be inevitable. Just watch for it. Watch for it. This story is told of years ago, of a man who passed away, and, and, and he was buried under a, a marble slab. And prior to having that marble slab come over him, an acorn, a very small acorn, fell and slipped into the place where his grave was. It was cl- the lid was closed, and no one thought anything of it. But that acorn, t- acorn took root. It began to grow gradually, but inevitably, it grew until the point when it cracked the marble and it overtook it. Now, I'm not a betting man, friends. I'm not a betting man. But I would have put my money on the marble. Wouldn't you? You put your money on the marble. You don't put your money on the acorn, but you would have been wrong and you would have lost and so would have I. Why? Because that acorn will inevitably grow. It becomes something. And as you look at the fruit of your life, and you look at your relationships, and you look at what God's been doing in you, it's gradual, it's internal, but it's inevitable as we continue to submit ourselves to the plan and purposes of the Lord. And we continue to, as we learned last week, continually be filled with the Spirit of God. Amen? All right, why don't you pray with me?